chapter, we will be studying hypothesis testing. And in fact, we're going to continue along with the hypothesis testing for the next few chapters. This is the real exciting part of statistics in my mind. In this section, what we do is we have some sort of an idea. And we take this idea and we collect data. And we see, does the data justify the idea or the claim that is made? This is the beginning of what is called inferential statistics. We studied descriptive statistics before where we collected data and we described the data, showing a graph of the data, calculating the mean, the standard deviation, or the proportion, depending upon what type of problem it was. And now we're going to try to make some inferences about the data. Hypothesis testing is done consistently and, and in uh, business and law and medicine and education, somebody comes up with an idea and we take this idea and we do research on it and see does the data support the idea. We have some notation that it's important to learn and the first is what is called the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis we denote as H with a little zero, H sub naught uh, next to it. The alternate hypothesis most often is known as H sub A, but sometimes some textbooks have a 1 instead of the A. Most textbooks, though, have H sub A. So we have the null hypothesis, which is what one of the claims is, and the alternate hypothesis, which is an opposite claim. Now, when we do a hypothesis test, we have several parts to it. But the first thing we have is we have to see what is our hypothesis and what are the types of decisions that we could make that could be correct, and what are the types of decisions that we make that could be wrong. So it's possible when we have a hypothesis right here that our null hypothesis could be true. By the way, we're always going to be testing the null hypothesis. What's written down in the statement could be the null or the alternate, and in a few minutes we'll get to determining how we find out which is which. But when we actually conduct our test, we always conduct our test based on the null hypothesis. It's possible that the null hypothesis could be true. And in that case, what we want to do is we want to not reject it. We want to believe the null hypothesis. If we don't reject the null, and the null is really true, then that's good. We've made a correct decision. But it could be that the null hypothesis is true, and we decide to reject the null hypothesis. In that case, we've made a mistake. And that mistake is called a type 1 error with the Roman numeral 1 here. Another possibility is that the null hypothesis is false. A statement is made and it's false. But we don't reject it. We say, OK, here's, here's the statement. Yep, I can buy that. In that case, we've made a mistake again. And that mistake is called a type 2 error with the Roman numeral 2. The fourth possibility is that the null hypothesis is false, and we reject the null. And in that case, we've made a correct decision. A very typical type of an example is if you have a defendant in a criminal case, let's say a murder case, and the defendant comes to trial. And let's say the defendant is actually not guilty. In the American system, we believe innocent until proven guilty. And let's say the defendant actually is not guilty. Well. The defendant enters the plea of not guilty, and we don't reject that as the jury. We say, okay, we don't have enough information to prove guilty, so we do not reject the not guilty. And it turns out the defendant was not guilty. Well, that was good. That was correct. Let's say the defendant says he's not guilty, and it turns out that the defendant is telling the truth, but we reject that claim, and we say that the defendant is guilty. Well, now we've made a mistake. That's the type 1 error. If the defendant says not guilty, but that's false, he really is guilty, but we don't reject it. We say, no, we think not guilty because we've made a type 2 error. That's a mistake. But if the defendant says, I'm not guilty, and it turns out that's false, and we reject his claim, then we've made a correct decision. Now, what we want to do is make the correct decisions. We don't want to make the mistakes. But we can't always um, avoid making the mistakes. And so one of the ways we try to do this is to 
uh, to avoid this is we collect a lot of data and we have a lot of data before we make a decision. Now, which mistake is worse depends upon the individual situation. In this case that I was just discussing, a type 1 error is considered to be worse, putting an innocent man, convicting an innocent man of a crime. That's considered to be worse than letting a guilty person off the hook. But in other cases, a type 2 error might be considered worse. Well, one way that we can make sure we never make the type 1 error is any defendant who comes to trial, we automatically say not guilty. And then we would never make the mistake of convicting an innocent person. Of course, we would also then always make the mistake of letting a guilty person go free. And so by minimizing one down to um, never happening, probability of zero of it's happening, we've made another mistake by always letting the guilty person off the hook. So we try to do, we try to come up with some values so that we don't make either mistake or have a low possibility. So let me just go over what these are a little bit more. A type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis when the null is really true. And the probability of making a type 1 error is equal to alpha. This is the same alpha that we saw in Chapter 8 for our unconfidence. The probability of a type 1 error has the same alpha, and it's meant to be the same thing, the probability of making this mistake, the same thing with our confidence interval. If you remember, if we were 95% confident, then we were 5% not confident. Same thing here. The probability of making this error is 0 0.05 if it's a 95% level. The type 2 error is we do not reject the null hypothesis when the null is false. The probability of a type 2 error is beta. This is lowercase beta in the Greek alphabet. Our goal is to minimize both alpha and beta. We don't want to make either mistake, but we, by eliminating one possibility completely, we maximize the other one. So we want to try to minimize both of these. In symbols, when we have a null and alternate hypothesis, in symbols we have H naught and H sub A, and this is one of those cases where the always actually happens. You'll be amazed here because we're always told, or we're told, not to have an always. But in the null hypothesis, we're always going to have something that deals with the equality, either equal, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. That will always go in the hypothesis, the null hypothesis. In the alternate hypothesis, we would have not equal to, that's the opposite, greater than, that's the opposite of less than or equal to, or less than, that's the opposite there. And those would always be in the alternate hypotheses. Now, what, our, what we need to decide, though, is when we look at a problem, whether the null is given or whether the alternate is given. So I'm going to do some examples with you. Let's say here's the statement. The statement is that 80% of college grads love their elementary statistics class. So 80% of college grads love their elementary statistics class. The first thing we need to decide is, are we dealing with an average or a proportion? And the hint here is the percent. So we're dealing with an average. So now I would look at this and I would say the null hypothesis, we're not dealing with an average, we're dealing with a proportion. So, sorry about that. We would say 80% proportion. The null hypothesis deals with a proportion, which means that the alternate hypothesis is dealing with a proportion. By the way, I hope you notice that I don't have any p hats. I'm testing the population parameter. I'm going to collect the sample statistics so that I can use that information to see is the parameter correct or not. And these are lowercase letters. The parameter is 0 0.80. That's 80%. The alternate then is the population proportion is not equal to 0 0.80. So the null is the proportion is 0 0.80. The alternate is that the proportion is not 0 0.80. How we know what the alternate is 
is we think of what's the opposite of the statement given. The statement says 80% of college grads love their elementary statistics class, and so the opposite of that would be 80% do not love their elementary statistics class. Let me do another example. Um, on average, families do at least five loads of laundry per week. This is the statement. On average, families do at least five loads of laundry per week. The null hypothesis then and the alternate hypothesis are what we need to look for. In this case, we're dealing with an average, so we're testing the population average. Again, remember that you're not testing X bar. You use X bar to help you make a decision about testing the population parameter. At least, the symbol for at least is greater than or equal to. That's the symbol for at least. And we say to ourselves, does this have the equality part in it? And it does. So we have greater than or equal to. And the number that we're testing is 5. And the last part we have to fill in is what symbol goes here. And here we say, hmm, what's the symbol? What's the opposite of at least five loads of laundry per week? And that would be less than five loads of laundry per week. So the opposite would be the average is less than five loads of laundry per week. Now, once we set these up, we could uh, make, we collect data and we make a decision and if we have made a type 1 error, let's look just at this laundry one because this is just so exciting. If we reject the null when the null is true, then we conclude that the average is less than 5 loads per week when, in fact, the average is at least 5 loads per week. So a type 1 error is to reject the null when the null is true. If we reject the null, we conclude that the average is less than five loads per week, when in fact the average is at least five loads per week. A type two error is to not reject the null when the null is false. So if we don't reject the null, we conclude that the average is at least five loads per week, when in fact it's less than five loads per week. Now, the consequences of this may or may not be significant. Consequence might be you don't buy enough laundry detergent when you go to the store and you need to get more laundry detergent. Not a major consequence. But if you are opening a laundromat, a consequence might be that you don't have enough washers or you have too many washers. So your consequence depends upon what action you're going to take based on this. Well, let's go over how to do a, confidence, a hypothesis test in general. And to do a hypothesis test in general, I think I need to make this a little bit bigger for you. To do a hypothesis test in general, the first thing that we're going to do is we set up our null and alternate hypotheses, and then we gather our data. Our sample data is gathered. That's the next thing we do. Typically, the data will favor one of the hypotheses. So typically, the data will either favor the null hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis. If the data favors the null hypothesis, we do not reject the null. If the data favors the alternate, we do reject the null. Those are the decisions. So we have two decisions. Do not reject the null or reject the null. That's a decision. Now we're always testing the null. So we're going to be testing, do we believe that the null is true? We're not testing, do we believe the alternate is true? We're just saying, do we believe that the null is true based on this information? After we make a decision, then we need to make a conclusion. So once we make a decision, like reject the null or not reject the null, then we make a conclusion based upon that. Sometimes we'll find out that we have an inconclusive test. That's when we come up with, and I'll discuss this in a little bit, a p-value that's at the same level 
of what we're testing at. Now our test could be left-tailed, meaning we're only going to reject on the left side, or right-tailed, we only reject in the right, or two-tailed. And this will start to make a lot more sense once we do an example. Associated with the null and the alternate, uh, associated with the null hypothesis is the preconceived alpha. This is the level that we're going to do the test at. And if none is given, the most common one to use is 0 0.05, meaning we only want to have a probability of 0 0.05 of a type 1 error. The data that we collect um, gives us the p-value or the level of significance. So let's look at an example. And to do this, I'm going to do an example that's in your text. This is an example written by a former student of mine, Nicole Hart, and she wrote an example called Fido's Fleas. And we're going to go through this because this is a much harder problem than I could ever give you. Fido's Fleas by Nicole Hart. And you have this in your text, so why don't you walk, look around with this. My dog has so many fleas, they do not come off with ease. As for shampoo, I have tried many types, even one called bubble hype, which only killed 25% of the fleas. Unfortunately, I was not pleased. So if we look at this big, long word problem, the only part that's important right here is which only killed 25% of the fleas. So this is lovely. It's a delightful problem. And thank you, Nicole, for writing this. But I'm going to cross this part off. I've used all kinds of soaps, and I had given up hope, until one day I saw an ad that put me in awe. A shampoo used for dogs called Good Enough to Clean a Hog, guaranteed to kill more fleas. Okay, so again, I look at this, and what's important is the word more. This is all lovely, but we'll cross it out. And all the rest of this is lovely, but all that matters is more. We want something that's going to kill more than the 25% of the fleas. I gave Fido a bath. And after doing the math, his number of, th of fleas started dropping by threes. Again, this is cute, but goodbye. With his old shampoo, I counted 42. 42 is important. 42 is the number of fleas he has. At the end of his bath, I redid the math. And the new shampoo had killed 17 fleas. So now I was pleased. 17 is the number of successes. Now it is time for you to have some fun with this level of significance being 0 0.01. You must help me figure out, use the new shampoo, or go without. Well, this is a really cute problem. And if we look back here, this is telling us that we're doing this at the 0 0.01 level. So our problem is given. Now, you have the solution also in your book but I'm going to work on this with us, with you. We're going to look at this problem, and the question asks us, what is it that we're testing? What we're testing is the proportion of fleas that are killed. Our null hypothesis is that the proportion is 0.25, because the old shampoo killed 25% of the fleas. Now. Nicole's not interested in not equal to, so that would not be, that's not good. What she's interested in is whether the new shampoo is greater than, kills greater than. So even though the old shampoo killed 25%, what we're interested in is the new shampoo killing more than 25%. This is what's called a right tail test. If we get a high enough value, we're going to reject if we're high enough in the right tail. Our random variable, now this is a capital, uppercase letter, p hat, is equal to the proportion of fleas killed with the new shampoo. That's what we're interested in. And now we're going to draw a graph. And on our graph, we're testing 0.25. That's what we're testing. This comes from the null. We're always testing the null. So 0.25. And then we're going to find, this is a lowercase p hat, which is 17 out of 42 
which is 0 0.40. And so we mark off, we're on a number line here. The number line is labeled capital. It's a shame that P is what's used here because this is uppercase. That one is uppercase. But right here we have lowercase. So this is capital P hat. And we have a number line we're going to mark off 0.4. Well, here's 0 0.25. 0 0.4 is over here. And this is the RP value. Right here is this area. What this area is measuring is if the null is really true, then the probability that we could get a sample statistic of 0 0.40 or greater due to randomness is the value of the p-value. So for this problem, if the proportion is really 0.25, then just from randomness, we could get p hat of 0 0.40 or greater. That probability is the value of the p-value. So what we need to do is we need to come up with our test statistic. Our test statistic measures how many standard deviations above or below the hypothesized value our uh, sample statistic is. So in other words, what we're measuring is how many standard deviations above 0.25 the value 0 0.40 is. Or you could say we're finding the z-score in this case. At 0.25, we're zero standard deviations above or below. At 0.4, in order to find this, we could do it by hand, and the instructions and the theory for doing it by hand are in your textbook. But we also know that what we're finding here is our z-score would be 0 0.40, minus 0.25, this gives us the actual difference, divided by 0.25p, this is p, q would be 0.75, 1 minus p, divided by however many fleas we're surveying, which would be 0.42. Now, what I want you to notice is that we're assuming that the null is correct unless we can show otherwise. We would get our test, our z-score, which is our test statistic. And that's what the value right here would be. And then the p-value would be the area right there. So let's do that now. We're going to come up here, and we'll go into doing our tests. And we're going to do a one-proportion z-test, which is the fifth one down. And we're testing at 0.25. We had 17 successes out of 42 fleas, and we're now testing a right-tailed test. So we're going to go over to the right-tailed, and I'm going to do this twice. Once by doing it with the calculating, and we find that we're testing is the proportion greater than 0.25 in the alternate. Our test statistic is 2.3163, so that's 2. Point, oops, 3163. 2.3163 tells me that 0 0.40 is 2.3163 standard deviations above 0.25. The p-value is 0 0.0103. This p-hat is 17 divided by 42, 0.4048. But my p-value now is 0 0.0103. And now we have to make a decision. And our decision is going to be based on whether we reject or not reject the new shampoo. It meaning that, does the new shampoo kill 25% of the fleas or does it kill more? So we came up with a p-value 
equal to 0 0.0103. And what we do is we compare our p-value to the preconceived alpha, the level of significance. If the p-value is greater than alpha, then our decision is do not reject the null. So in this case, our p-value is 0 0.0103. We only want to reject when we have a, an area of at most 0 0.01, which would be right around here. This area here would be about 0 0.01. The larger area is 0 0.0103, so we do not reject the null. If the p-value is less than our preconceived level of alpha, then we would reject the null. So in this example right here, if we were told do this at a significance level of 0 0.05, then our decision would be reject the null because 0 0.0103 is less than 0 0.05. But the problem said do this at the level of 0 0.01. And so now we've made our decision. Do not reject the null hypothesis. The reason is 0 0.01 is, what is it? It's greater than, it's less than 0 0.0103. And then our conclusion is that the new shampoo kills 25% of the fleas. If we do not reject the null hypothesis, then we go back to the null hypothesis and we conclude that it's the case and we would not reject it and conclude that the new shampoo kills 25% of the fleas. So when Nicole has to decide, should she use this new shampoo that's a lot more expensive, what she's deciding is, is it going to kill more fleas? And if she wants to do this at the 1% level, she would decide, nope, I think I'm going to keep the null hypothesis that the new shampoo still kills 25% of the fleas. Well, that's a very long done out problem with a proportion. I'm not going to have time to do a problem with the averages, but you can do this similarly. When you're testing an average, you're going to have the average that you expect or you're testing in the middle of your graph. You're going to calculate your test statistic, and based on the test statistic, you decide, do I reject or do I not reject the problem that we're testing? Now, in the textbook, you have many problems that were written by former students such as this one that I just did. These are great creative problems, and they're more like what happens in the real world of testing a big problem where you're just faced with a situation. We're going to continue on with hypothesis testing in the next segment, Chapter 10, but in there we're going to be making it a little bit more elaborate. So study this part first. Bye-bye.